Commissioner Fwad? Here. Commissioner Stahakin? Present. Commissioner Yakubian? Here. Commissioner Wiseman? Here. Chairperson Welch? Here. Next item. Item 1B, flag salute. Chairperson Welch. Please rise. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item, please. Item 2 is posting of the agenda. The agenda for the Monday, February 22, 2010 regular meeting of the Gundal Transportation and Parking Commission was posted by Friday, February 19, 2010 before 5.30 p.m. on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. Very good. Thank you. Next item. Item 3 is approval of minutes. Item 3A is January 25, 2010 regular meeting approval of minutes. Does anyone have any... Uh comments or changes in the minutes? Uh, just one brief correction. The second to the last paragraph where it says uh, Commissioner Sahakian brought up variances and what it will take to have the TPC provide input to the Planning Commission. When it comes to new development or IT trip generations, IT. that should be ITE. Little, little one. <laughs> Any other changes? So I have a motion to accept the amended minutes. Uh, so moved. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. All righty. Next item, please. Item four is oral communication. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. I have uh, one speaker card, uh, Herbert Milano. Uh, good evening. Uh, commissioners of the Transportation and Parking, city staff, my name is Herbert Milano. At last month's meeting, uh, we had an issue of a taxi cab owner's permit up for renewal before you. And it included a report by the city staff with regard to their compliance with regard to their quality of service to residents of Glendale. Mr. Sahakian, I believe, asked a very, very pertinent question with regard to the quality of this particular report. And the, and the, the question was, was that report generated independently by the city or was it simply pre self-prepared by the cab company and simply submitted to the city? That question as posed by Mr. Sahakin was not answered. So I decided to apply for a California Public Records Act to see if it could be corroborated independently. What other information was there? The answer I got from the city attorney's office was basically the very same document that was presented here. It was non-compliant. So I began to wonder why it is that such a critical question was not answered. In support of, Mr., uh, of the taxi cab company's application, we had two attorneys. One of them was former Mayor Sheldon Baker. And the other is attorney John Ganthus, who also sits in the Civil Service Commission. And I have a significant problem with that. And I think that you might find that a problematic. Mr. Ganthus is in a position to wield pressure and undue influence on the city staff. Because if there ever is a position or a situation where they need to come before the Civil Service, they'll have Mr. Ganthus to contend with in making that decision. And I think that type of conflict of interest should have been disclosed and presented to you by the city attorney present at the time to say, Commission members, we have an attorney who is also sitting in judgment and can sit in judgment of the city staff. So if I were a city staffer presenting a report, I would really question whether I would be willing to present any negative findings on Mr. Gentis's client. Now, a few years ago, um, the... Um, Mr. Jano Bagdanian, a respected and competent manager, applied for the position of directorship of Public Works. He lost out to Mr. Steve Zern. Now, if that position becomes open again, I would expect 
Mr. Bagdanian to apply for that position. But what if that position is denied? Would he not appeal to the Civil Service Commission, being a civil service position, and say, wait a second, I contest that. You denied me the opportunity of getting this particular position. And sitting there would be Mr. John Cantus. Tell me if that is not a clear and potential conflict of interest that Mr. Gantus is wielding before you and before the staff. Because that critical question, was the report independent or not, was not presented to you. Now, when I re required and asked for another public record site with regard to the number of applicants um, to the Civil Service Commission, there are basically none. Well, I should say five, the only applicants who basically got selected. In other words, the, the city clerk did not do a proper due diligence and reach out to the general community to look for individuals who could serve in the Civil Service Commission. And Mr. Gantus has been there now for three terms. That means that anybody looking at Mr. Gantus, way off into the future, he'll, say he'll probably remain there for a long time, wielding his influence and basically serving as a hammer if he doesn't get what he wants or if others don't get what they want within management. So you see, the problem of conflict of interest and undue influence is a significant one that you should address and you should question whenever someone comes before you promoting a particular client. I think that there are plenty of capable individuals in the city of Glendale who can serve in the Civil Service Commission. So that Mr. Gantos could independently represent whoever he wants, but not with the undue influence of having sitting there in judgment of Mr. Gantos or anybody else in management. When I presented that to the Civil Service Commission, another Civil Service Commissioner told me, well, he should have a problem because I also have a conflict of interest. So now you got two individuals with conflict of interest presenting issues before other boards and commissions. And this is where it, the problem gets even worse. Mr. Gantis was selected by Councilman Aaron Ajarian. And he's also the same gentleman, Aaron Ajarian, who selected his own sister to sit before you. So it puts an individual in a position to be able to sell influence if he so chooses to go out there to the public and say, I have someone inside TPC and I have someone in Civil Service Commission. If I choose to basically carry your project forward, I can do so. And that is the problem that I'm finding in Glendale significantly in many areas. And I think that it needs to be addressed. And it is the responsibility of the city attorney to make sure that any potential conflict of interest be addressed prior to your making a decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item, please. Item 5, reports action items. 5A is report regarding proposed preferential parking for the 100 to 300 block of Windsor Road between Brand Boulevard and Glendale Avenue and consideration to recommend to the City Council the preparation of the comprehensive district parking plan for the South Brand Boulevard area. At 5A1 is resolution approving one of the following. At 5A1 is uh, to establish a no parking 24 hour, seven days a week, except by permit parking restriction on the 100 to 300 block of Windsor Road between Brand Boulevard and Glendale Avenue. At B is to establish a no parking 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. seven days a week except by permit parking restrictions on the 100 to 300 block of Windsor Road between Brand Boulevard and Glendale Avenue. At C is to establish a two hour 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday except by permit parking restriction on the 100 to 300 block of Windsor Road between Brand Boulevard and Glendale Avenue. At D is denial of establishment of preferential parking on the 100 to 300 block of Windsor Road between Brown Boulevard and Glendale Avenue. And 5A2 is motion recommending that the City Council approve the preparation of a comprehensive district parking plan for the South Brown Boulevard area. Okay. Um, I've noticed a lot of people in the crowd will be having a, taking public commentary, so if you have not filled out and submitted a speaker card, please do so. Um, Mr. Bagini. Mr. Chairman, members of the Transportation Parking Commission, uh, uh, the staff report that we have prepared for the Windsor Drive um, uh, preferential parking uh, request uh, was based on a petition that we received from the residents of the Windsor Drive, um, I'm sorry, Windsor Road between Brand and Glendale Avenue. Uh, the residents petitioned that they want to have uh, preferential parking on that block 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Their main concern is because employees of the businesses 
along Brand Boulevard uh, or Glendale Avenue, they use the on-street parking available uh, for their employee parking or for their visitor parkings that are parking on the street. Uh, in your packet, uh, if you can have the lights, please. Uh, in your packet, this uh, I have for the benefit of the residents or in the audience, this is the area that uh, Brand Boulevard, uh, Glendale Avenue, this is the area in red which has under, uh, which has been petitioned for preferential parking. Uh, the area in blue is uh, Maryland uh, Avenue, which already has a preferential parking uh, to our except by permit uh, that is uh, has was implemented in 1985 as a result of the similar concern by the residents that uh, employees from the auto dealers or business in the area are parking and they don't have uh, adequate uh, uh, on-street parking for their customer, uh, for the residents as well as their guests. So this was implemented. Uh, the, currently, we did a professional parking uh, field survey in order to determine the, the extent of parking that is occurring on Windsor Road uh, based on our uh, field survey that uh, is shown on the next slide. Uh, we found that you can see between uh, Brand Boulevard and Glendale Avenue, almost 90 to 100 percent of the spaces are occupied throughout the day. And we did surveys on several days. It's in your report uh, that 90 to 100 percent of the spaces are all occupied uh, by residents as well as by visitors or employees that are parking on this portion of uh, Windsor Drive. Uh, also, we looked at the parking on uh, Maryland, and on Maryland, about 75% of the spaces are occupied uh, throughout the day. Uh, this already has preferential parking, so it, it's, it has two-hour parking, so it's a combination of the residents or employees that are parking there. Uh, if you look at um, Maryland to the north of Windsor or Louise Street, again, off-street parking, on-street parking is at prime uh, on these uh, streets in the in this part of the city, and the majority of people, most of them, apartment buildings that don't have adequate off-street parking, they rely on the on-street parking supply in order to park uh, on street. Um, we uh, had this issue discussed at the last transportation parking commission meeting. And uh, once we started uh, the process, we notified the auto dealers in the area, we notified the businesses in the area, and their concern that was expressed is that this is going to be a larger, uh, larger scale problem because obviously if we address, try to address preferential parking on Windsor Road, we're going to impact the adjacent street, we will impact parking on Brand Boulevard where the customer parking is used for auto dealers and all the streets basically from Colorado south uh, to Chevy Chase or Los Feliz will be impacted if we were to just go block by block and start pre uh, implementing preferential parking. Uh, Pacific BMW, uh, which is located in this uh, area, uh, well, went to, in 2003 went through a complete renovation uh, and they uh, built parking for their customers, for their employees. Uh, by code, they were required to build 253 parking spaces. The parking code requirement is for retail, so about uh, every 250 uh, feet, square feet of space requires one parking space. So essentially, they built 253, about 20 spaces more than the, they were required by code. So, question, is that combined customer and employee? Customer and employee, that's okay, correct. So that, that's a combined. That's yeah. correct. We okay. do not, uh, in the code, uh, as part of their approval, they did not necessarily designate, like, specifically how many employee parking or how many customer parking, but based on the auto dealership, their experience with this type of a, um, a retail facility which sells cars, uh, the total came out to about 237 uh, or something, and they built 253. That was required uh, more than what was required for uh, by code. Uh, these spaces are uh, again not required specifically in the mitigation measure that they have to designate X number for customer parking or X number for employee parking, but it is what the total number uh, they provided. Uh, there is 30 spaces that are actually designated on site that for employee parking and employee are parking there right now. We did a field check on that, and actually most of those spaces are used by the employees that, uh, that are parked in those designated employee parking spaces. The rest of the spaces uh, in the entire structure are used for inventory. You know, new cars are parked there. They have uh, parking for their uh, 
mechanical maintenance or people bringing cars for their repairs. They also have a valet parking service for their customers, so customers pull up on near Brand Boulevard, they pull in and the valet takes their car, they park them on site and uh, provide customer uh, parking for, their, uh, for the visitors to the auto dealership. In addition, based on our discussion with the auto dealership, they also provide parking in some of the lots that they own, as well as their dealership, which is on uh, Pacific Avenue. They have another uh, repair facility there that uh, they have a shuttle service that they shuttle employees back and forth between the two facilities depending on the need. So the maximum on a daily basis, their inventory varies. As you know, any auto dealership has more cars on one day if they sell more cars. They wait for the inventory to arrive, and they, uh, you know, use those parking spaces for their inventory parking as well. Uh, based on our observation, <coughs> they said 75% of the spaces that are on Windsor, there's 40 on-street parking spaces that are not marked, but essentially you can park vehicles there. From the 40 spaces, 75% of those spaces, 76% of those spaces are used by non-residents. When we do our survey, we do a, um, a license plate survey and we determine how many of those spaces basically are not residents of Windsor Road, Maryland, or Lewis. So if they are based on that, we say, okay, these are non-residents. We can't tell whether they are Pacific BMW employees, their customers. Or, or residents from other streets, but basically they are considered by our survey what we use in our analysis, uh, essentially 76% are non residents. Uh, but the other 25%, it could be resident on Windsor Road, could be uh, from Maryland or from uh, Louis Street. Um, what we did then, uh, based on what we know, uh, we have also met with the petitioner from the uh, Windsor Road. We met with the Pacific BMW management. Uh, we've asked them that by their approval uh, that was given to them that they need to require all their employees to park on the BMW facility premises. Uh, that was a requirement. And um, our understanding of what they've told us, they, they do attempt to ask their employees to park there. But like any other employer, you cannot force an employee to park on the facility per se, because, you know, they can decide to park on brand, they can park on, um, on Windsor, but they do their best and they provide the designated spaces for their employee. This is what we've been told by Pacific BMW. So essentially at this point, uh, what the commission, uh, we've given you four options. Uh, those four options are the petition meets the required for preferential parking on Windsor Road. Uh, meets the signature requirement, meets the on-street parking uh, occupancy requirements, um, and we have a, technically a precedent here in this area where we implemented provincial parking on Maryland for similar reasons. So based on the request from the residents, the commission can approve no parking 24 hours, seven days a week by permit only on the 100 to 300 block of Windsor Road between Brand and Glendale Avenue. Uh, another option could be establishing a no parking 6 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Essentially, this will uh, allow on-street parking throughout the day, like it is today, uh, but it will restrict the parking at night. This is not really going to address the residential parking because the residents already, um, you know, most of the time at after 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Most of the employees that are working in these businesses have already left or they're leaving around 5 o'clock. Uh, so essentially all the on-street parking at night is being used by residents. So we don't think really this will help the residents one way or other because they, practically speaking, it is already happening today. Um, the other option would be to implement uh, a two-hour 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. preferential parking, which will be similar to what we have on uh, Maryland uh, from Windsor to Garfield. This will be consistent uh, with that requirement. Remember, if we put in provincial parking on Windsor, that only residents on Windsor will be able to park, then the residents from Maryland or Louise will not be able to park. This is the reality with provincial parking. Unless, again, the Commission has discussed about some form of a district parking that the on-street parking is shared with all the residents, so you should one permit everybody in that neighborhood within a certain square blocks uh, is able to park. So, however, if so, the impact of putting the two-hour parking in place, at least it will be consistent with Maryland. 
uh, it will provide some relief to the residents, uh, but then technically it will force out the employees because they would have to move their car every two hours. Again, provided that we do adequate enforcement to make sure that employees uh, are every two hours, you know, they know that enforcement is going to occur, then they're going to have to move their car. The last option uh, for you to consider is uh, uh, denial of establishment of preferential parking. Uh, given the fact that we are also, as another action item, uh, the commission, uh, we're requesting the commission's approval that sit, go to city council and ask the city council's approval that we do a comprehensive study in this area because Windsor is just essentially opening up the Pandora's box. You know, we've had this problem in this area in, of residential uh, streets in uh, south of Colorado. It's been an ongoing problem. We have parking uh, problems with the uh, apartment buildings that are old and they don't have enough, enough on, uh, off street parking. So residents rely on on street parking. At any, uh, any block, the first block east or west of Brand Boulevard or uh, Glendale Avenue, because you have businesses along Brand or Glendale Avenue, you have most of these businesses also uh, don't have enough <coughs> off-street parking, so their employees, whether it's a retail shop or bakeries or whatever it is, they rely on the on-street parking throughout the day, so they park on-street on this area. So one way of addressing this for a long term, and maybe in the interim and the long term, would be to do a comprehensive <coughs> study in this entire area and uh, address that. We have discussed this uh, idea of a comprehensive study with our consultant who work with us on the mobility plan. Uh, we have a proposal from them, and if the commission approves the concept, uh, we will take that item to the uh, city council uh, tentatively schedule in Mar for their March meeting, uh, where we're giving an update to the city council and request their approval that we do a comprehensive study. However, from a staff standpoint, since Windsor Drive already was in the process almost a year ago where they started the process, they didn't have a complete application a petition in place until we got that everything completed in November of last year. Uh, we feel that uh, at least Windsor Road deserves the consideration for the commission of some form of preferential parking, which obviously can change once we do the comprehensive study. So uh, based on to give you an option between um, resolution A, 1A, which is the no parking 24 hours, <coughs> or 1C, which is the two-hour parking, except by permit, Monday through Friday. Weekends, based on discussions with the uh, residents, and based on what we've seen, is not as much of a problem on weekends, because you don't have most of the auto dealer, like mechanics or their parts people that are working, or the businesses along here have less employees parking on street. So weekends is not as much of a problem as it is during the week, uh, Monday to Friday. So commission has the option of approving uh, either A, one resolution 1A, or resolution 1C. We give you those options. Both of them, staff is, uh, uh, you know, um, okay with both of those options. We feel that will be helpful that rather than just go with one option, allow the commission to receive input from the businesses and the residents, and then based on that collectively, we can make a final recommendation which one of these options to be considered. But in any case, we're requesting Commission's recommendation on the motion recommending City Council approval of a comprehensive district parking analysis. There's one more thing I wanted to point out that might be helpful to you. And Jeff, if you can show me the table, not the next one. Um, in your staff report, uh, we have, uh, we did a basically a rough calculation of what the parking demand is, strictly looking at the residential units uh, that are on Windsor Road. Um, if you look at the residential units that are along Windsor Road, there is a total of 81 um, residential units, six, small, uh, six single family, uh, and there is uh, 76 um, multifamily residential units. If you take an average of 1.75 vehicles per residential unit, uh, you, will you will need about 152 off-street parking spaces. Uh, we did a, what we did is we walked in front of these residential units, we looked into the parking garages. Based on how many cars we could actually count that there were parked there, it was about 87 spaces. Some 
residential units, they actually park their car in the in the driveway or they're parking in the aisles. So essentially, somehow they're making it fit as much as they can. There's 87 off-street spaces, 40 on-street spaces. So the total of 127 spaces are available for Windsor Road residents. If you subtract it from 152, you have about 25 space shortage. So if nobody else parked, None of the residents from these other streets park. Windsor Road will still have a shortfall of about 25, maybe 30 spaces. So if you take away all the on-street parking by non-residents, 75% is parking in the 40 spaces on, on Windsor Road, you have about 30 spaces that can be made available, and those spaces essentially come close to what the residents of Windsor Road will need to meet their parking you know, on-street and off-street parking requirement. So it comes close to that. However, then you will still have an impact on Maryland, on Louise, because those residents are also using those on-street parking uh, spaces on, on uh, Windsor Road. Just so for, for you know, to order of magnitude, what's the off-street, on-street availability supply of parking versus what the demand is. That was a very ro- rough calculation. I mean, we didn't you know, go unit by unit and actually count each one. We did this just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude of what the problem is. And this is going to be very, very similar to what you see on most of the residential streets south of Colorado. Uh, everywhere is almost 90 to 100 uh, uh, percent occupied on a daily basis. And then uh, you have a combination of residential and, and uh, employee customer parking that is occurring on the streets. <coughs> so you will have this situation uh, on most of the streets as, as you go down, uh, as I said, between Colorado and uh, uh, Los Feliz Road. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, you, some of the commissioners sent me some emails, and if you, have, you still have those questions, I'll be happy to answer them uh, throughout the meeting or right now. At your pleasure. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Bagdad, I have a question. I th- you had mentioned that uh, at nighttime, I guess after the 6 p.m. time, uh, there would be mostly residential residents parking on those streets. But looking at the occupancy study, I don't see any um, data, you know, uh, even the 8 p.m. slot, you maybe went once. I think just once or 7 p.m. There's you know no information about that. How did you come up with that? Um, we uh, on those we just actually drove the street. We did not do uh, individual like a license plate survey. We my staff drove the street at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. We did some on Saturdays at night just to see what the occupancy was. And given the fact that most of these auto dealers, except for the Dealers, auto dealers that, uh, for example, they're uh, salespeople that work till 9 p.m. that are less than the totality of the dealership where it has mechanics, parts people, and so on. Most of the spaces where it appeared that are all uh, residents that are parking there. Okay. So, you know, by after 6 p.m., most of them, most of the employees who are parking there have already left or they're in the process of leaving. And then at the same time, you've got residents that are coming back home to from work and they're parking on the street. Mr. Chair, isn't the dealership open till 9 p.m.? They're open till 9 p.m., uh, but not all their operations uh, are available, I mean, operating 9 p.m. Most of the uh, their uh, mechanics shop, the repair shop, usually, you know, they stop working about 5, 5.30, while only their customer service part is open where co- people are coming in late just to pick up their vehicles that have already been repaired and done. Most of their mechanics are already gone. Uh, Mr. McDanian, uh, you mentioned uh, Pacific BMW as part of a mitigation measure had to allocate space for customers and employees. Yes. Uh, between for employ- looking at each each uh, group separately, for employees, do you believe there's sufficient park- on-site parking for employees, and together with the busing to the other to the other lot, there is sufficient employee parking without the necessity of parking in Windsor, and then. For the employ- for the customers, the same question: Is there a view that there's sufficient on uh, on-site parking within the dealership for customers? I.e., what is the what is the dealer demand for Windsor? Um, on based on our observations, again, we're going back and look. We've looked at um, the Pacific BMW. Uh, one thing we can tell is how many of their customers. You know, the Vantage Brand Boulevard has with the auto dealers. You know, you can park a couple of blocks up and then walk down to these other dealers. So 
there's an advantage where they, you know, customer parking occurs on Brand Boulevard specifically. How many are actually going into the structure? We couldn't do a count of that. There's some valet operations, so there are customers that are going in. We can't tell whether they're, you know, uh, going to buy a car or they're dropping their car off. That that was difficult for us to determine. Overall, within the structure, there is uh, there was we just did a survey a couple of days ago before the staff report was prepared. There was adequate parking <coughs> in the structure itself. Now, some of those spaces were vacant because the inventory wasn't there, and there, so there are cars that are, will be coming in to fill those spaces. But there was 30 spaces that were designated for employees, and all of those, pretty much all of them, were vehicles were parked in there with a permit that showed us that they were actually complying with the employee parking. Uh, to what extent, if that day they had 70 employees working in the in the dealership, and the other 40 are either parking there or in the rooftop or in one of their other lots, we, we were not able to determine that. We requested Pacific BMW to be here to, if you have questions specific to the operation, but based on our surveys, that's the extent that we could determine. There is adequate parking on the, in the facility itself, uh, technically, to accommodate the, the customer parking and the employee parking. And how's it worked out on uh, on Maryland? Are the residents happy there with with their, the result of their uh, similar to one? On C? Maryland, uh, just to give you an idea, there is the units we have on Maryland. On Maryland, just to give you an idea, eight hundred block of Maryland, there is thirty on street parking spaces. Um, 64 residential units, 47 uh, permits have been issued. So 18 out of the 64 uh, requested professional parking. You know, on an annual basis, we monitor how many permits are issued. So out of the 64, 18 are using it, and we've issued 47 permits because, you know, if a two-bedroom, if two vehicles, they get two permits, or they also get a guest permit. Overall, the occupancy on Maryland is about 75%. Uh, so there is parking available more so than it is on uh, on Windsor. So that tells us since 1985, since they haven't come to us and say, well, you know, this is not working for us, that tells us that the, the parking is working for them. Uh, obviously, there might be violations on Maryland because some employees may park there and not move their car every two hours. But overall, I don't think uh, there is a problem with it. it. It seems to be working since 1985. And I noticed under the Pacific BMW bridge, there's no there's a, it's red curb. There's no parking. Is it? Why is there no parking under the bridge to give additional um, spaces? Commissioner Ford, I believe there is a condition uh, that. In the condition that because of the driveways that goes in and out of the Pacific BMW off of Windsor Drive. To enhance the site distance and eliminate potential hazard at the driveway, it was a mitigation requirement that they do not park any park spa uh, parking. There will be no parking on Windsor Road. Uh, do, you know, do you recall, do other dealers have similar driveway issues? Obviously, they didn't have a we on the, otherwise. Is there parking allowed between their driveways? You know, the, the analogous situations uh, for other dealers, do you know? I can tell you, but most of the driveways for the, these dealers, uh, we do have red curbs. Along Brand Boulevard, for example, where we have angled parking, we do restrict parking uh, as you approach their driveway so that we can allow cars to turn in. Some of the, <coughs> some of the other issues is with two of trucks, when vehicles are towed, and they have to enter, you know, with a tow truck, you're towing a vehicle. So that was another reason for restraint. We did look into it, but it probably is not going to help them with their on-street parking or off-street parking needs. And, and just one final question for now. Why 6 p.m.? Why not like 5 p.m. for the cutoff? Because I would think a lot of people come home between 5 and 6 and they wouldn't have any spots available then. Is that is 6 a magic number? No, it's really not. Uh, the... Uh, <coughs> Usually it's 6 p.m. because we're trying to get employees that are working later, uh, you know, to force them to not park on street. Most of the city we have 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. as a nine in, not 9 a.m. Maybe it's 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Most of the city we have that kind of a requirement, but it's not a magic number. It could be changed to 5 p.m. 
That's all I have for now. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Um, when you were doing your uh, reviews of Maryland, did you actually happen to notice any cars that were in violation at the time? In other words, they had to park there longer than two hours with no permit? Yes. Yes? Do we, you wouldn't happen to have any data on the parking violations issued on Maryland? We can't tell whether, I mean, unless there's a parking permit hanging. Uh, well, obviously, if there's a parking permit hanging, then we know it's a, <coughs> it's a resident. But the rest of them, we, don't, we can't tell you if it was actually a, a guest, for example, visiting mm -hmm. one of those residents. Although they can get a guest permit and hang it from their rear view mirror. Uh, but in most cases, it was difficult. But overall, we think uh, it's working. There are days that are more spaces are occupied, and that can be taken care of by enforcement. Okay. And on option number B, option letter B, um, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., seems a little counterintuitive to me. I mean, since, since the parking demand was greatest from uh, uh, the 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. time slots when it was 90 to 100 percent, wouldn't it be more logical to do it 6 a.m. to 6 p.m.? I understand that this was one of those uh, items that came from the auto dealers that we said we will include it, but I agree with you that that doesn't make sense in terms okay. of the parking problem is throughout the day. So if we were to do it, it could go a modified uh, option A or it could be option C. But that we included it uh, because... You know, and we heard about it from some of the auto dealers that why not do that at night? Because, but if you do it at night, all residents are the only ones who park there, so they're going to be fighting with each other as right. far as who parks there. Okay, that's that's clear. Yeah, I just and I guess a similar question is what is what is the value of if parking is not an issue? Why it's it's one C is a variation of one B, just pared down. Is there a one one C is essentially keeping it consistent with Maryland, so it doesn't shift the traffic uh, parking uh, from uh, Windsor Road. So actually, so actually, there is no restriction at night under one C, is there? Correct. No, that's okay. right. Okay, then that's true. Right. Okay, if there's nothing else, we'll uh, take public comments now. Um, should we listen for the, from the applicant first, the original applicant, because I don't have a speaker card from him. Are you going to speak? You want to speak? Yes. Okay, why don't you come on up. Just make sure you get a card in, please. Thank you. I was just thinking, but... <clears throat> please don't activate this. I may need more time. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Welch and the Honorable Commissioners and City Staff. Uh, my name is Rasmik Grigorian, and no, my name is not David, although quite often I feel like David uh, in the epic of David and Goliath in this issue. And I trust that, uh, you know, the, a good resolution will come out tonight. Um, I'm a property owner on Windsor Road. And uh, we started this process uh, just about two years ago, just under two years ago. And the, the reason for that was why we did this two years, because for years since after BMW renovated their space, we've ha we were having problems with um, the parking situation, and we eventually decided that there is something that we should do about this. Believing in our democratic process, we have played this game by the rules. We compromised, we showed willingness to work with the city staff, accommodated the needs of BMW. We have given them ample time to clean their act. We have shown flexibility and good faith in every step. And as a result, a process that normally should take about a few months has taken around two years. Based on the current code of the city, where the petition is uh, based on, vacant units are considered a no vote, and 75% of the people of the street have to vote for a petition. Having said that, 
we have 86% of the residents signed for this. That doesn't mean that the other 14% have not signed or have said, no, 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 we are very happy with this situation. These, the remaining 14% are either the absentee ones, which we couldn't get them because of their time schedule and whatever, or the vacant units. In fact, not one single person has said they were happy with this situation. Not one. And I am 100% sure that even statistically speaking, if every person, 86% of the people that we have approached has said yes, then the other 14%, if they were there, they would have said yes too. So 100% of the people of Windsor Road, between 100 and 300 block, are supporting us and are signing on this petition. And it's very clear. The only per, uh, entity who is opposing this are BMW. And their address is not even on Windsor Road, they are on South Brand Boulevard. Even the businesses on Glendale Avenue on the corner have not opposed this petition. All the buildings along Windsor Road have been built much prior to BMW's modern and best facilities and all of them were built based on the codes and requirements of parking at the time. 1920s, there were not many cars in the streets and whatever they did, they did in good faith based on the codes at the time. Now the world has changed, people need more cars. It is interesting, the latest addition to Windsor Road is BMW and they have actually built their facilities based on the latest requirement, which is, according to Mr. Bagdanian, 253 spaces for employees and customers. Mr. Bagdanian just said that 30 spaces are being used by the employees. What about the, the, the other 223? Do they have 223 clients every single time in, uh, in their building? If they do, that's a great business. They, they, they would do a lot, they will make a lot of money and they will not have to, uh, they will build their own parking structure and they will not have to impo impose their situation on our residents in the street. <clears throat> Actually, in addition to that 253 parking in uh, uh, their facility, they have 100 block of uh, 100 block of buildings, or as uh, Commissioner Fuad correctly asked, they have a, a, a half a block in there that nobody is using, and they have 25 parking spaces in front of their showrooms on Brand Boulevard. So there is plenty of parking. Why would they have to stomp on us? I don't understand that. <clears throat> in a meeting with. Uh, 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 Mr. Bagdanian, Mr. Brown, Mr. Dobrowski, and Mr. Nick Lamb, the general manager of BMW, and myself in November of 2009. We discussed all these issues, and again we said, fine, we give you some time to clean up your act. Maybe you can start asking your employees to come back and um, uh, not to park in this street. We agreed on this. He went away. Nothing changed. Nothing. It is really unfortunate that this honor system does not work. Because we were hoping that an honor system will be at place and we don't have to go through this burdensome process. One more minute. <sighs> I need a little more, please. <clears throat> Do your best. Thank you. Mr. Lem in that same meeting said that their initial request was for approximately 165,000 square feet of space and the city granted them 245,000 square feet of space, almost 80,000, almost two acres more to accommodate those parking spaces. What they are doing now? They are uh, using that for inventory and not for parking. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not here to bash BMW. I really am not. They are great business. They provide a lot of tax dollars to the city and they make great cars. I want them to succeed. I don't want them to succeed by stamping on all these people in this audience. 
<clears throat> I am even surprised and puzzled and somewhat also disappointed that last time uh, South Brand Boulevard uh, Car Dealers Association and the Chamber of Commerce stood here and they defended them while they knew that BMW is violating five points out of 12 points of their conditional use permit. Item number 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Is this really their position? Anyone can violate the CUP? What about if I violate my CUP in my own little home? Can I get away with it? In the last two meetings of this commission, Mr. Reggie Louis of BMW said that they want to be part, uh, they, uh, find a solution and they want to be part of the solution. I applaud that. I welcome that. If he was here in the audience today, I would give him a big hug for that. However, why not start with just complying with the CUP and not violating that and not violating these people's rights? That's a good start. If you don't create the problem, there is nothing to solve. <laughs> you might think I'm crazy, but I am. Because I get crazy when people stomp on other people's rights so selfishly and so arrogantly. We are talking about solutions. There are many, many solutions. BMW can... Uh, they have a uh, facility on the corner of Pacific Avenue and San Fernando Road. Two acres of empty lot. It used to be their uh, uh, mechanic or body shop. It's empty there. Why can't they have a shuttle? And shuttle their employees from there to, to their uh, facilities. The same thing with 500 uh, South Brand Boulevard. It's an underused empty lot with BMW. They're not using it. All they have to do is walk two blocks. Our residents walk more than two blocks every day to find a space to get to their home. <clears throat> they can use those 25 parking spaces. They can use the uh, space under the bridge. And also, I found out that uh, the uh, Parking and Transportation Commission has offered BMW $1 per day per car to use and store those cars at city parking facilities. $1 per day. The average resident is paying $1 an hour. And they refuse to do that? They sell seventy thousand uh, dollars average uh, worth cars. Can they? If and, and if a car sits on the lot for a month, it's only thirty dollars. They can't afford it. There, there are talks about ad hoc committees uh, for a similar compromise uh, to to get uh, to comprise of city staff, residents, property owners, and businesses to uh, get together and study that whole area. Excellent. I welcome that. I volunteer for that. I want those businesses to succeed. Don't get me wrong. And, but meanwhile, I don't want to wait. We don't want to wait. We have waited since 2004 and 2008. The two key issues, when the BMW building was completed and when our petition started. I urge you. Oh, and some people say, this is very tough. It's not tough. All they have to do is just abide by the CUP that was imposed on them when they were doing their uh, building. I urge you commissioners, I'm going to wrap up, I urge you your commissioners to listen to the will of the people of Windsor Road, 100% of them, and vote for 1A. 1B is laughable. You just mentioned it. We don't have a problem between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. When this report came to me, I thought that was a joke or a typo error. It's not. It's serious. What are they trying to do? There is one option which is missing in here. Maybe we should have paid parking meters on Windsor Road and permits for, uh, for, for uh, residents. That way, if they pay 20, uh, $1 for every 20 minutes or a half hour or even one hour, they wouldn't park there. They're parking there because it's free, because their inventory then gets into their 253 parking spaces. Item number 1B is laughable. Item number C is not what we want. We have analyzed it. We have checked it. We know the problem on Maryland Avenue. On Maryland Avenue, uh, BMW employees switch places. After two hours, they drive to Windsor, and the one who stops on Windsor drives to Maryland Avenue. Quite often, they come and take two spaces with one car, waiting for their colleague to arrive. When the colleague arrives, that little car either goes forward or backward, and another space is created for another BMW employee. That's, that's really, really insulting our intelligence. 
And item number 1B, again, I don't think it's option. We waited enough and we have suffered enough. So what I really urge you, commissioners, to do the right thing, to vote for 1A, and if in the future this proposed committee comes with another solution which is a better solution, we will change it. I'm all for it. And I want you to know, the reason we went for Windsor Road only was because we advi were advised by the city uh, uh, staff not to do uh, uh, Maryland Avenue and Lewis because it would have been easier to do the uh, Windsor Road. And when the Maryland Avenue people found out what we were doing, they said, oh, we want to do it, we want to do it too. They were ecstatic about if you grant us that 1A option. And I promise you it will happen because if, uh, you know, they are waiting anxiously for this. They are sick and tired of BMW also. 253 parking spaces. Maybe I should go and park there tonight. Okay. All right. I thank you. I really urge you to do the 1A, and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Next speaker and... Uh, Just one quick question, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Mr. Gregorian. <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry. Before the expansion, was there a problem? Not as big as this. And I'm concerned that with Mercedes-Benz expansion, it's going to get much worse. When you say not as bad as this, can you just explain that? Actually, I believe there are residents that have been living in this street for much longer than I have owned that building in that street. Maybe they can uh, verify that situation. Mr. Chair, if, when they come up, please, if they can identify if they've been in the neighborhood longer, long enough. So. Okay. And just, uh, I don't really have a question for uh, Mr. Gregorian. Uh, perhaps it's uh, more for Mr. Garcia. Uh, as a clarification, you mentioned several times a conditional use permit. And my understanding is we're dealing with a mitigated negative declaration, which is not quite the same animal. I, it was <coughs> the conditions he was speaking of were, were mitigation measures okay. in the environmental document. Yes. Because those are handled differently than CUPs are handled. That, that's correct. Okay, thank you. My, my understanding is that that CUP is your package is the DRB uh, number uh, 1-3254-A, which was adopted on August 14, 2003. That's nothing to do with the environmental report. That is the DRB conditions for BMW building to go forward. Okay, just, just so we're clear, I, th I think what uh, Mr. Gregorian is uh, referring to, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, is uh, typically a project in the project area gets a design review approval from the redevelopment agency, and with those approvals uh, are conditions which include conditions complying with the environmental document. And I'm not sure if staff can anything to that, but they were probably mitigation measures to, to that particular uh, approval. Is that qualify as the same thing as a conditional use permit? They no, it's not. Um, the mitigation measures are the things, uh, measures that have to be complied with. But uh, and, I, and I wouldn't be able to speak to the particular mitigation measures. Um, but I don't believe that there they were requirements that they actually park in. In that, just the only requirement was that, the, as Mr. Bedanning stated in his report, that the parking be provided by the by the uh, owner of that facility, and, and it has been. So I think that's the that's the dichotomy here. Was is, is parking being required? Was it required to be built? And it was. And that they satisfy the mitigation measure by doing that. Uh, Mr. Garcia, item number nine specifically says that they will not use the local streets and they will not impact the residents of that street. Yeah, I recall reading something like okay, that. Okay, well, too. I'll be happy to take a look at it and comment on it. Well, that's it. not a, just to clarify. That's not a mitigation measure. If they don't comply with the mitigation measures, they wouldn't even get an occupancy permit. So there are other right. conditions that they're not fulfilling that were attached probably to the permitting process. Um, Mr. McDaniel, I have a question uh, for Mr. Gregorian's comments, uh, two questions. This 252 or three <coughs> spaces that we're hearing about, what, what, was, what was the purpose used for those spaces? Is it, is it allowed for inventory, or is it supposed to accommodate inventory customers and employees? And secondly, have you observed what uh, he, he mentioned about people employees switching back and forth during the day, and is that legal? Um, by the city's municipal code, technically you can park on a street or in a block once per day, and uh, then you have to move your vehicle at least 200 feet before you can park in that same space again. So if somebody is switching vehicles or um, they were doing that, uh, if they went to the next block and they're farther away, technically they're okay. But if they're you know, moving their car from one side of the street to the, the other side of the street, then they are in violation of the city's uh, parking uh, Did order. you observe that in your um, travels? I have not. Um, I will refer. Have you 
Commissioner Fraud, members of the commission. Um, during my uh, studies out there, I did not see any vehicles being um, switched out, <clears throat> as Mr. Gagorin is stating. But I did see vehicles that were parked far enough to allow another vehicle to come in, park in between the other vehicles, um, as somebody would be saving another parking space for somebody. I did see that, though. And, and the, the 252, three parking spaces, what, what the, were the purpose of the spaces? The, basically, on the square footage of the project that was approved, uh, based on that, they, they uh, required to provide uh, one space for every 250 feet. So basically, if it was a retail uh, establishment, that's what they would be required to do. So that's what they did. So the planning department, uh, redevelopment agency, looked at the square footage of the building, they said you have to provide X number of spaces. How that's not spelled out, how those spaces technically can be used, but essentially when you have a retail establishment or an auto dealership, uh, the reason you provide, require that parking <coughs> is for their customers and for their employees. Uh, obviously, some of that space is also being used for uh, the, um, the inventory parking that they have. And they have actually more than 250 spaces because uh, on the upper levels, there's uh, more parking that is available. So uh, the 253 is the minimum uh, that was required at the time. It does not spell out whether it should be, say, 100 should be for employee or 150 should be for. Since that approval, if I'm correct, the agency staff has been more specific in the subsequent approvals from other other dealership that actually spells out in their conditions that or mitigation measure that so many have to actually be designated for employee parking or customer parking. Just as a last note, as an answer to your question, Mr. Fouad, no. I have asked the, some of the employees of BMW who park in the street, and I say, don't you have a parking spot in your building? Why do you park in the streets? The answer is, the management does not allow us. I'm quoting them. I know the names of these employees, but for obvious reasons, I'm not going to mention who they were until they are necessary. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Henry Rodriguez. My name is Henry Rodriguez. I reside at 736 South Louise Street, which is the corner of Windsor Road. We have apartments on Windsor and at uh, the corner there. I've been a resident of the Glendale and Louise Street for 55 years, probably longer than any of you that have been residents of Glendale. <clears throat> I can't believe all of these issues that have come up because someone failed to do an environmental impact study prior to uh, the BMW uh, facility being built there. Anytime you con uh, construct such a facility such as the BMW and the Mercedes-Benz, there should have been an environmental impact study conducted, uh, not only with the uh, facility, but with the, uh, the residents of the community as well. I don't recall ever getting a, a, a questionnaire asking us, what do you think will be the impact of this facility being built here? we would have responded immediately, parking, uh, test driving cars on our streets, speed as well, and the transportation bringing in, the trucks bringing in all these vehicles uh, stacked two, story, two, two um, stacks high with about 20 or 30 cars on these uh, long trader trucks. They park on Windsor Road at the corner of uh, Brant and Windsor Road. They block our passage for free uh, driving through that street. Um, that's why they don't have parking on that street because they're using it for unloading and loading of, of not only the vehicles but the parts of the, uh, for the facility. The idea that we have to have uh, a permit to park on our street when we live there 24 hours a day, how would you like to live uh, under, under these conditions where you can only park there for certain hours of the day and you have to have a permit? I don't think any of you would like that. I appreciate the opportunity that you've given us to voice our opinion and um, regarding these issues that we're, we're concerned with. Uh, Mercedes-Benz is not the only one that is a fender of the employee parking. 
We also have Nissan and um, Mercedes-Benz. We have all of those employees parking on our streets. I called the city one time about the uh, speed driving and we wanted bumps put on the street. They said, how do you know that they're employees of those facilities? When they get out of the car, they have their name tags on their, car, on their shirts, BMWs or Mercedes. How do we know? It's quite clear when it's written on their shirts and they're parking right in front of our house. And as you know, there's no parking on Thursday and Friday because of the street cleaning, which compounds the problem of our parking. We have to get there early enough to get parking or late at night to be able to park on the side of the street where we won't get a ticket. I've gotten tickets before. Unfortunately, during the development of the expansion of BMW and all these other uh, dealerships, there was no uh, environmental impact study conducted. You don't do the environmental impact studies or social science research after the fact that buildings are built. You do it before the buildings are built to get the impact, full impact, so that we don't have this problem parking. Uh, the consultants that uh, you have working on these facilities, I question their expertise waiting for day 10 when it should have been done on day one to um, develop, develop uh, environmental <coughs> impact studies. Your numbers that you have about the number of employees that park in the, in the structure, I question the, the le legitimacy of that with regards to the number of uh, employees that park there. The only way you're going to get the legitimacy of the employees parking there is by having the names of every employee that works there. I don't care about customers. Um, we don't know how many, how many employees are working there. Do you know? And I'm sure you do. How many are there? I'm asking you. Can you answer that? Uh, is that a fair question? It's, okay. It's not, okay. It's not we'll, a, we'll, uh, okay, we'll ignore that. But I think you understand what I'm saying here. Um, if they do any kind of social science research, uh, all of that would have to be detailed and listed on documentation so that, uh, and I will ignore that. Um, Please don't, sir. We've got a lot of Okay, okay. Let me, let, me, let me just get on to, uh, um, uh, again, I, I mentioned that, um, that we are residents uh, that live there 24 hours a day, not 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And in conclusion to these items uh, that's voiced by other members of our neighborhood, uh, we hope that, the, um, that these um, issues uh, in our residential area be uh, seriously um, assessed and, and evaluated to the best outcome of this, um, this committee. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just one comment. Uh, you looked at staff and, 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 and stated environmental impact reports. Staff does not prepare environmental impact reports. It is not. It's, it's, it goes out to bid and it's consulted. I understand prepared. that. I understand right. that it, it is a, a subcontract with another uh, entity, such as the university, that has the expertise to do that. I understand that. And um, the resolution that we have here, that I have here, that has been developed. That answers my question. Yes, yeah, sir. Your, your time is over, okay. so please. All right. Okay, next speaker, uh, uh, Herbert Milano. And please, everybody, we've got a lot of speaker cards, so please stay within your time limits. If you don't have a lot to say, please cut your comments short and be respectful of everybody else so everyone will have a chance to speak. Thank you. Chairman Welsh, members of the Commission, uh, my name is Herbert Milano. The problems that you are seeing today is an outcrop of a significant problem that exists throughout Southern Glendale, especially in areas where you have residential and commercial interests bidding for the same thing. Now, I'm going to tell you why there is no environmental impact report. The environmental impact report and the determination to create one is made by the Environmental Planning Board. Do you know who's in there? The city attorney, the, the planning director, and the director of public works. There are no residents, no external parties except internal staff making up the Environmental Planning Board who determines whether or not an environmental impact report is required. So we start with that problem. Now, 
There is a need for a comprehensive report regarding on-street parking availability throughout all these neighborhoods in Southern Glendale so that that information becomes available to those individuals who are considering any type of design review approval or negative declarations. In fact, I would suggest that anyone creating or proposing a negative declaration, <coughs> if it has a negative declaration concerning parking, that it come to you for review. But why doesn't it? Well, part of the problem that we have is that there is a significant, what, conflict of interest in different ways. Look at yourselves for right now. How many of you reside in Southern Glendale? Not a one. College Hills, Northwest, far north uh, Glendale. We need individuals who feel and, oh, you do, excellent, who understand really the, the impact of this thing. And the same thing when people are being selected for Design Review Board. The issues that we have are issues of influence, of a dealership or a business with a large requirements for parking, you know, providing campaign contributions to the city council, you know, and expecting a quid pro quo that at the end of the day impacts the quality of life of these individuals. You know, and it is a significant problem. The, um, there is a need, not only for an evaluation like this to be made available comprehensively, and to be updated on a continual basis, maybe every couple of years, as the City Council continues to approve variances that eventually get appealed to them to basically have a reduction in parking and an impact on this overflow onto the streets impacting the daily lives of these residents. Part of the problem is that the City has had an opportunity to have a resolution to it by taking redevelopment money and creating parking parking structures, buying the properties, and making it available to businesses throughout the area. But it's not happening in Glendale because that money is going someplace else. If you go to Burbank, you find free parking. If you go to Arcadia, you find free parking. Structures being built for the common benefit of residents and businesses, and primarily for the businesses to take the inflow and outflow. But it's not being addressed. That means that there is something deficient taking place with regard to city planning. And I think that the obstacles to that are conflicts of interest, significant number of conflicts of interest that are impacting the very reason why we have a government, which is to a city government, which is to improve the quality of life of its residents. And that's not taking place, not for residents of Southern Glendale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, Dan Cashin. Hi, my name is Dan Cashin, and I'm a resident of 815 South Glendale Avenue, and I'm opposed to the preferential parking on Windsor because of the fact that I, as a handicapped card holder, I, I need to not park on Glendale Avenue on certain street cleaning nights before, and I use Windsor right before the, the Windsor Square as a place to park to walk to my resident residence. And um, while I'm here, I'd also like to ask, Jono, in your survey of Windsor Avenue, have you ever noticed the car carriers offloading on Windsor Avenue? Uh, well, so, I mean, it's, I don't... Sir, the, the, you're speaking to the, the panel up here, not, okay. not directing questions. To well, he said he, he does a survey, um, a drive-by survey. I understand. And as, um, many, and as many times as I go down Windsor Avenue, mm -hmm. when when the... Um, Just please make your comments about it. That you're, you're providing testimony and evidence to us, so we, we can take that into consideration. It's an accident waiting to have happen with, with the offloaders there. Uh, and when you're going east on Windsor... Um, People coming west are, are going around the transporter, and I'd just like to, to, to make okay that known. Mr. Bagdini, I do have a quick question, though. Are, are handicap placards, will they qualify as being exempt to park in a, in a permit parking zone, or would they still have to have? Yes, that's correct. Okay. They so, are exempt. Sir, even if we did put permit parking in there, you would still be able to park on Windsor if you had a handicap parking placard. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, next speaker is uh, Julie Terrell Travis. Hey, 
Thank you. Um, I brought my baby today because it's just that important to me that we pass <laughs> this uh, parking measure. I'm in support of only one option, too. That's 1A, the 24-hour preferential parking. Um, uh, and I'm not the only mother of a young child in my building. I, I reside on the 200 block of Windsor Avenue. Can you state Avenue. your name for the record, please? Julie Terrell Travis. Thank you. Um, there are four parent, or four families with children under the age of two in our building, and it is very, very difficult to go shopping and have to walk three blocks with your child and you're shopping together. It would be very nice to park on our own street in front of our own homes, especially since it's not actually necessary for um, the for instance, the, the employees of BMW or Mercedes or whomever to park, they have adequate parking. I think that's been established. So um, we just want to get what's fair and what we've been waiting for. But in addition to that, as a result of the, um, the failure of the BMW employees to, um, uh, to uh, abide by the, I guess you're calling the mitigation measures, um, there's a lot of traffic, very speedy traffic up and down Windsor Avenue. A lot of right-hand turns down Windsor Avenue um, in, in search of, I'm sure, parking for, for the mechanics and um, other employees. And this is very dangerous. It's very dangerous, and we, as, as the parents of small children, we have a very, a very big concern for that. Um, and I'm just asking you to approve this uh, measure and to also enforce those those measures that um, they're supposed to be abiding by anyway. If they just did what they were supposed to do in the first place, as Mr. Gregorian said, we wouldn't be here. But that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Chair, quick question. Yes, sir. Quick question. So if, if this commission is to support 1C, you would oppose that? Um, is that the two-hour parking? Yes. yes. Um, I don't think that's ideal, but it would be <laughs> it would be better than nothing. Um, I think the ideal situation would be to um, to support one A. Um, I've have seen this tag team parking going on. Um, I've uh, that's that is to say, um, two employees working together to switch cars or to take up spaces, and so I don't think it would be the best solution. Thank you. Uh, Judy Kendall. <clears throat> Chairman Welch, members of the Commission, City Staff, um, Judy Kendall from the Glendale Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we don't feel that prefer preferential parking is, is the solution. Um, we are definitely in favor, though, of your moving forward and seeking approval from the City Council to um, for preparation for a comprehensive parking plan. If we feel if you do um, approve this this request for preferential parking, that you consider 1C, um, thinking that this would give some relief for the residents and uh, force the businesses to some degree. But, but think the, the, um, the larger plan, looking at the, the larger issue here in the whole South Brand Boulevard area is really important um, because it's, it's this entire area where there's a problem that has been allowed to happen. And we certainly need solutions for residents and for businesses in this, this unique area. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Chair, one quick question. Yes. Ms. Kendall, specific BMW here in the house? Are they here? Are they, are they here at I don't know. Meeting? I don't know. Thank you. Brian Gantz. Good evening, Brian Gantz. I reside at uh, 218 East Windsor, the 200 block. Live in the same building as Julie, the lady with the baby. Um, one thing that struck me, uh, I want to thank you for hearing this, first of all. One thing that struck me, this gentleman was talking about field studies. Um, I'm not sure if 
people like BMW get an advance notice of these field studies, so it looks like everything's tidy and the cars are all parked, the employees are parking and the employee parking. I can give you another field study, somebody who lives there. Parking's a nightmare, and it's made a nightmare by these auto dealers. Absolute nightmare. Maryland is not working out. It only works out with the 75% of the parking taken. There, there are spots open because people that live on Windsor are not going to park there and then have to leave their apartment every two hours to, to move their car. So those are left open. Again, Mr. Gregorian, I have also witnessed the switching of the cars, the double parking of the cars, the arrogance, the brazen arrogance that these car dealers are uh, um, implementing on our block is, is, is it's absurd that we're even here. If these places have ample parking on the premises, why are these employees not parking there? When I first moved into my apartment, I was so enraged that I went down and talked to somebody at BMW, and you know what he told me? They don't want to park in the upper, upper areas of the garage, the roof, and the, they don't like to park there. And this gentleman was saying earlier, well, we can't, we can't expect BMW to force their employees to park there. Why not? Why can't they require their employees to park on the premises? What, what is that? I don't, I don't understand why that, that, that's such a big deal. Um, they're not utilizing their parking. And as a couple of people have said here, they've spoken to some of the mechanics and other people. Uh, why don't you park there? And they say, the management doesn't allow us. So, I mean, there's a red herring here. Some, somebody's lying about something. What I do know is, is that, um, and not all of us work nine to five jobs, um, and we're still productive parts of uh, society. Um, I do not work a nine to five job. Uh, I work in television, I work at nighttime. And if I leave my, it's almost as if they have spotters on the roof. It's pretty amazing, like a, like a, like a sniper would have. The minute you get in your car and start it, somebody takes a spot from BMW. It's, ama it's incredible. I don't know how they do it. It's, it's, it's amazing. They've, they have it down to a science. Um, and, and on a personal note, um, we have a lot of new mothers in our building. And I was telling uh, Mr. Gregorian just last week, um, I came out one morning and one of the mothers was out front with her baby and she kind of, she was kind of like looking around and I said, what, what, everything okay? She looked kind of uh, lost or confused or something and she said, well, I'll tell you, I have to, I have to go to CVS Pharmacy, but I, if I know if I leave, it's going to take me an hour, hour and a half to find parking when I get back. That should not happen. And you talk about businesses, bus people are not flocking to Windsor Road to park for the laundromat on the corner or the Armenian bakery. There's ample parking there. The problem is the auto dealers, not the other businesses. We do not live in a highly, we don't, we don't live next to the Americana. There's one problem. And the other thing, you know, I think it was this gentleman was asking about parking under the bridge. BMW does utilize that space. They park cars there and they park their transports there almost every morning, which from what I understand is, is, is illegal. So I am, Hope that you uh, come to a conclusion to, for uh, item A, um, because the two-hour parking, I think, uh, is not going to make much of a difference. They're just going to continue to switch the cars, and uh, I, I don't think that that's really the answer. The answer there's, it's absurd that we, that we even have to go through this when they have ample parking there. And uh, one, one last thing. I also, I was in a bad accident and I go to physical therapy twice a week. It's the same thing. When, the, when I first had the surgery, I was in very bad shape and there were mornings that I canceled physical therapy because I knew that if I went, when I came back, I would not be able to find parking. That should never happen. Not on a small residential street. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Kenneth Wong. Uh, Mr. Chair, just one comment mm -hmm. and don't need an answer for it. Staff field studies war was in favor of the residents. Hello. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Kenneth Wong. Um, I live on the 200th block of uh, Windsor Avenue. Um, I, I just kind of like to reiterate what's been said in terms of, uh, especially what uh, Brian just stated, um, is that um, it's very difficult to. Uh, I, I also work from home, and. Um, if I go out at any time to like go run an errand, go to a meeting, it's 
impossible for me to find parking any time between two and five. If, and I, I'd also make the, uh, make that a point that um, one B would be impossible um, because, yeah, basically uh, it doesn't alleviate any problem for me. If, like if I return uh, within that time period, so um, because past five o'clock, it's not a problem. It's never a problem past five. Um, uh, I would also like to say that. Um, so basically, I'd just like to say that um, I'm in support of uh, 1A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Linda, no. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Linda No, and I'm a resident of um, the 200 block on East Windsor Road. Um, I've been a resident there for just under two years. Um, initially, my I just had one point to raise, and that was in regards to the conditional use permit. But as we clarified earlier, it's not a conditional use permit, but a mitigation um, measures that um, had requirements that BMW was supposed to meet in order f to re to get the approval. Um, now, it it brings me to question. Well, with the mitigation measures, there were requirements that that BMW provide sufficient parking for its employees and its customers. Now, because they were given the approval, the assumption is that they, they met those requirements. But seeing that we're all here tonight, clearly there is some kind of flaw. So it's almost as if, I, I'm not trying to accuse anybody here, but it's almost like there was some kind of loophole where BMW built, technically built enough parking for their employees and customers, but in reality, those it, it appears that those parking spaces are not being used for the purposes that they were built for. So my opinion is that something has to be done to address that issue, because then what is the point of having a mitigation measures or a conditional use permit? Because without any kind of repercussions or enforcement, what, what is the point? Then, there, then any developer can technically meet on paper that, you know, we are providing this and meeting all these requirements, but in reality, if they're not doing it, then that is a very big problem. Now, based on my personal observations and talking to other residents in the area, BMW employees are parking on Windsor Road on a daily basis and it is causing a problem for the residents. So either BMW is not providing sufficient parking or the employees are parking on the street by choice. But in either instance, BMW is responsible because in the mitigation measures, they claim to have provided sufficient parking for their employees. But clearly they haven't. So they, they should be held accountable in some way. Now, this, I think, is an issue that really needs to be addressed because it is setting a very dangerous precedent. So in conclusion, I would ask that you vote for option 1A of the agenda item 5A, the 24-hour restricted parking, without further delay. I've spoken to many of the residents and we believe that that is the only option that would adequately address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Jean Brewer. Hello, I'm Jeannie Brewer, Acura of Glendale, and I'm one of the infamous car dealers on the Brown Boulevard of cars tonight. Um, the good news is that we've all been successful, and it's not just businesses, but it's that apartments are rented and everybody is, is jockeying for the very same parking spot out on the street. And it is a tough, um, it, it's a tough situation. Um, I know it's very difficult when you can't, when you don't have reasonable parking close to your home. And it sounds like those parking spots weren't made available to people who um, 
had rental or home units or somewhere close by. In the same frame, um, uh, BMW has been very successful, like a lot of our dealers on the boulevard have been very successful. And we hope to continue to keep growing. So what do we do with all of the residents that live in the area and all of the employees that want to park out on the street or all of the um, customers that need to a quick stop by? Not everybody comes into our dealership for service and they want convenience, just like some of our employees do. Just about every single dealership provides uh, employee parking. I know we park um, a little far off of our site, um, but we, we provide that for our employees. We pay for that, and most dealerships do. Most employers do. But this isn't limited to the car dealers. We also have um, restaurants in our area that have um, opportunities for big functions, and they all park in our parking spots, and we just all have to figure out a way to get along. That's why I decided to come tonight to let you know that I know the Brown Boulevard of Cards looks forward to having a discussion on what the correct way for our parking in South Glendale on the Brand Boulevard of Cars in Glendale and the surrounding businesses because on the south end of the street you also have hospital parking, school parking, customer parking, employee parking. It's all in this whole big area and it does need to be addressed and so we would look forward to be a part of that discussion and that's the one thing that um, I know that each dealer um, would love to be a part of that discussion tonight so or in the future. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tim Tierney? Uh, Tim had to leave. Had to... Child, he lives on. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Ampero Malari? Good evening. My name is Amparo Malari. Um, I own an apartment building on East Windsor Road. I'm another disabled person. I have a complicated disease. It's uh, sarcoid arthritis. Um, anybody who knows arthritis knows that regardless of the age, it's very painful, especially when the legs are involved. Uh, anyhow, going back to the building, I had a nice dream of owning an, an investment property. I bought the building, mortgaged two properties actually to you know add on. But anyhow, uh, we made the building look beautiful, but now I have a major problem. The problem is parking, and I'm unable to convince people that it will be better. Some people come and you know they set an appointment, we show it, but they don't even want to get off the cars because they've been circling around the property for you know. 5, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long, and they go, I think this is going to be a problem, so thanks for showing or attempting to show. Um, again, it's unfortunate that after making so much effort beautifying the building, now, especially in this you know, hard recessionary times, unable to you know, fill it up. Um, Anyway, taking the standpoint of a disabled person, it's hard enough for me, so I can imagine how it is with you know, people with children or other disabled people. And also, taking the position of an investor is even harder. So in any way, in any case, I just urge for 1A to be approved. I think it will help all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And the final speaker I have is uh, John Travis. Everybody doing? Uh, I'm a resident of 200 Windsor. Please state your name for the record. Uh, John Travis. And uh, I came a little late, so I think there are quite a few fastballs that have been thrown already here ahead of my notes, so maybe I'll throw a change up or two. Um, I'm glad the Acura woman is here tonight. I'm not sure what. What was to be gained of that? And I would like to think that everybody is in the auto industry is uh, willing to help out. The, the problem is we don't have a choice. We have to park on the street, many of us. So it's not a choice of whether we want to park on the street or we don't. As Mr. Uh, Gregorian mentioned, 
These buildings have met all the criteria when they were built, and many of them don't have the, the correct number of uh, uh, parking facilities. So we have to park in the street. It's not, it's not even an issue. Um, I've, I'm sure this was brought up earlier, but um, what I was interested in is that the entire expansion of BMW was to create parking spaces. That's why they expanded. So it's, this is one of those times where somebody's looking back and going, what? I mean, these guys built parking spaces. That's what they did. They built 50,000 or 60,000 square foot of extra parking spaces. And I think somebody has talked about the ancillary um, lots. I just looked on one on Google Earth right now. It's over 7,000 uh, square feet. There's 57 cars there. Um, and today, tonight, there are about 15. So they have one lot, apparently, with signage on the front, Pacific BMW, that can hold over 60 cars. There's a lot on Maryland that holds over 44 cars, not to mention the tens of thousands of square feet on the property. I really, I really believe that I feel bad for BMW is who I feel bad for. I feel bad for the employees because either they're told to say they're not allowed to park there or they just say that for whatever reason, they shouldn't have to jockey for parking spots. Okay, if you can't make BMW have people park in their lot, fine. They're going to park in our spaces. So we have to do what we have to do. We have to park in our spaces too. Our space is Windsor Boulevard. For me and my wife, it's Windsor Boulevard. We have an eight-unit building that has five parking spaces because that's what the city required at the time or allowed at the time. It's the only space that they could fit in the back alley there. We have uh, another um, large building that's being built on the block to our south that's going to compound the situation parking on the street. We have Mercedes-Benz, which is going to expand. Um, I'm not sure if the Infinity is going to expand or not, but it has certainly over the past few years. Um, the idea that these ancillary uh, parking spaces are literally 20 feet from the property and 300 yards from the property, two blocks up on Lomita and Brand, really serves itself to wonder this notion of inventory and what have you. Inventory for automobiles can be less than a day from, from San, San Pedro, where most of the inventory is kept. So it, it's not, um, and not to mention the fact that when you purchase a car, it's usually prepped and everything, and it usually takes two days anyway to get your car, brand new car. The idea that the inventory is taking away from employee parking doesn't really make a lot of sense, especially when we're talking about hundreds of parking spaces, thousands of square feet of parking. Brian mentioned earlier about literally negotiating with your own brain as to whether or not I should go to CVS to get something. That is a literal truth. I came in to look at our property when I came in to, to look for an apartment, and we drove around, and that was the one consideration was parking. Mr. Gregorian said, we're working on on it, and we're, we have something in front of the city council, and I said, and he's been a man of his word, and I said, okay, and this is the day. And uh, look, it's adding a few pounds there. Um, and the idea of going out and saying, like, man, I got I to gotta think about whether or not I want to move my car. Under normal circumstances in any other place, you'd, you wouldn't have to think about that because your place would be taken. It would be taken by somebody. It doesn't matter. However, in this particular circumstances, we know who's taking the, the places. Mr. Rodriguez talked about it. Guys coming with their, with their um, name tags. They're driving BMWs. They're working on BMWs. Some of them drive BMWs, and among other cars. They, um, they park there. So we know who's parking there. We know they have plenty of room to, to, um, to park on the, pro uh, on the property. And we know that the whole expansion was to make parking lots. So it seems pretty, pretty obvious and pretty, pretty simple that if we can't have them ask their employees to park, we have to have a, a place to park. The only, the, only, um, ram the only remedy for this is number A. Um, 
under the resolution, it, number A is 24-hour parking because we live there 24 hours a day. So uh, I want to thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, commentary. Um, you want to start us off? Well, when I came here this evening, when I came here this evening, I was uh, sort of favoring one C because it seemed like a, a compromise. But the residents have told us that there's this tag team parking, and and I can believe it. So for me, one C for that reason alone is out. It does seem that Pacific BMW has enough parking if they change their inventory practices or, or allowed or encouraged uh, employees to park at that site or, 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 or close by site. It also struck me as a bit of a loophole that the code requires parking and then, oh, by the way, you don't have to use the parking for its intended purpose. Uh, and at, at, this, at this remove, we can't uh, force we can't redo the mitigation or the CUP or, wh or whatever it is. But I think the solution seems to be clearly 1A because that would give the, um, the residents what they need. Uh, it's, it's not that much of a, of a disconvenience for Pacific BMW because they clearly do have adequate parking. They have a, almost a brand new facility. And I would also like to say uh, that my saying 1A for here would not be a precedent for other uh, for other locations within a proposed parking district. I think we would have to almost look at a street by street by here. But here, as several speakers have noted, it's almost uniquely well suited to do 1A because it's a recent facility with adequate parking, with actual physical spots. It's just a matter for BMW to allocate those in a way to accommodate the neighbors. And debating whether to go to CVS, that's all struck me as well. Thank you. Well, I would say I agree with uh, Commissioner Fouad's comments and uh, the thought that was running through my mind after hearing that BMW cannot compel their employees not to park on Windsor. Well, we can. Um, the uh, I've, I've been uh, down there several times over the, the past uh, week at different times of the day just to observe conditions. And the last time I went down, uh, after receiving our packet for this meeting, I had the list of mitigations from the mitigated negative declaration. Now, kind of my impression when I look at this is I see 12 mitigations listed. And of those 12, eight of them have to do with transportation and traffic. So this tells me that in terms of significant environmental impacts from this project, that need to be mitigated, uh, transportation, traffic, and parking are really the lion's share. And I have to say I'm disappointed in, in several respects. First of all, that there's no one here from Pacific BMW available to answer questions. Because what I'm about to say, I may, I may be wrong. I may have missed something, and I may need to be corrected. But uh, the, the second thing that bothers me was there seems to be a fairly large number of these mitigations, as has been mentioned by some of the speakers, that have flat out not been complied with. Now, I notice uh, for a lot of the mitigations, the, they involve an inspection prior to issuance of development permits or prior to final building inspection. They don't specify any kind of ongoing uh, monitoring uh, that I can tell. But as far as I can tell, the, just because somebody checked off on a checklist, okay, we inspected it, this mitigation has been met, um, what if the mitigation disappears the next day? I mean, they're, they're meant to be permanent, is, is my assumption, and not transitory. And so starting with mitigation number six, uh, which says the use of the parking structure's internal speed ramps shall be limited to employees. And then the last sentence says appropriate signage shall be posted to inform customers and employees regarding restricted access to the garage. Uh, that does not exist. I've looked for signage uh, mentioning restricted access, and it's not there. Like I said, I was hoping somebody from Pacific BMW might be here, just in case I missed it, to let me know I was wrong. But that's the first one. Uh, number eight, I wasn't sure about. I was hoping to ask their representative about unloading vehicles. And we've heard testimony from several uh, residents here tonight that they unload on Rinzer Road. And reading again, mitigation uh, number eight, 
the applicant shall provide for loading and unloading area on the project site. The unloading of vehicles, parts, and other materials shall only occur on the dealership property and not on any public street. Well, that doesn't seem to be happening. So now that's two of them. Um, mitigation number nine says that employee and customer parking shall be clearly marked. Again, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see any such markings. However, I'm not going to say just because I didn't see them, I'm going to call that a strike against them. So let's move on to number 10. Eastbound travel on Windsor Road beyond the public alley shall be prohibited from any project driveways through the installation of appropriate and enforceable signage. Again, no such signage exists, and on several occasions when I was down there, I observed vehicles coming out of those uh, project driveways and turning eastbound on Windsor Road. So now we have our third mitigation that is not being complied with. Um, number 11 has to do with test drive routes for vehicle service to the dealership. I didn't personally observe that. We did hear some testimony uh, today, uh, this evening, that uh, that is possibly not being complied with. But again, because I don't know, I'm not, I'm not going to say one way or the other on that. However, number 12, the, the last mitigation, which is related to number 6, the... Uh, the requirement for the uh, internal speed ramps to be used by employees only. Number 12 specifically calls out the need for enforceable signage prohibiting public vehicular access to the dealership property via, via Windsor Road. And again, as far as I've been able to observe, no such signage exists. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed at what appears to me to be less than a 100% good faith effort by Pacific BMW to meet uh, these mitigations. And uh, because of that, I will be supporting uh, 1A at this point. Thank you. I also tonight came with a mindset that I'll be supporting 2C, like Commissioner Fouad. But it really, it really ticks me off and makes me mad that Pacific BMW is not in this room. The reason I ask this, this question to the chamber is because you represent the businesses. It's public outreach one, two, three. It's community outreach for dummies. The first thing that I would have said to BMW is you get your behind in that room out of respect to the residents and to the commission, period. That doesn't sit well with me. And having Acura sitting next to you doesn't tell me much. That's number one. Number two, I really find it hard to believe that employees have assigned parking on the premises, but they park on Windsor. Are we dumb here? If you have, why would you park and walk to the building when you're assigned a space inside the building? Now, there could be other reasons for it, as maybe you park and then you're blocked with an inventory of 20 vehicles, and to move your vehicle out, they need to move other vehicles out of the way. That could be a possibility. I also looked at the mitigation measures, and, and uh, uh, like uh, my colleague stated, every one of them is true. There's no signage there. They were parking under the bridge. There's tons of violations here. Now, I came here to find a balance between the businesses and the residents. I'm pro-business. I'm not against the businesses. But there's enough ample parking on this property. There's no ifs and buts about it. And the 253 spaces don't even include the 25 spaces in front of the building. So if we're to add, we're looking at 275 some, some spaces. In addition to that, some parking lots owned by BMW that are a couple of blocks away. There is no effort by BMW to come to a, a balanced conclusion on this issue. They would have been here. If I'm corporate BMW, that manager will be looking for a job tomorrow. Whomever's running that show, I'll be voting for 1A. 
Uh, very, very well said, Commissioner Sahaki, and I, I'm in complete agreement with all, all the commissioners that have spoken today. Um, I, you know, take offense on, on another issue. Also, someone had come up earlier and had mentioned that because I live in College Hills that I do not have perhaps the sensitivity to deal with issues concerning um, South Glendalians. Um, that would be similar as me saying uh, someone who lives in Tahunga shouldn't be allowed to come up and speak on issues concerning those residents of Glendale. On a personal note, I'm a mother of three. I have had children. My children have gone and attended schools in South Glendale. I have friends who live on Windsor Road, uh, a little bit further east between Glendale and Verdugo. And the parking on that street, when I visit them, is atrocious. And they do not have the problem that uh, you have. So I can only imagine uh, compounding the problem with um, with the Pacific BMW, as, as we believe they're they're adding to the troubles, uh, it must be a horrible ordeal to just live, to live. Um, as it was mentioned, yes, College Hills. That's where that's where I live. We also had a similar problem, and why the city created the Glendale College Preferred Parking Program because in that area we had overflow of students from from the college and um, although you know we that was a problem for the residents in that area it's slight compared to the problems of the residents living on Windsor Road who don't have that parking themselves they have to park on the street so I am in complete agreement um, with with the commissioner so far and and I will be supporting 1a Thank you. Well, I have uh, very little to add to that, um, but uh, I do have a couple of comments I want to make for the record. <clears throat> uh, in my observations, I actually did observe uh, a tow truck dropping off a vehicle on Windsor. Um, I happened to ask the driver why he was doing that, and he says that's because BMW, that's where they want them to do it. So there was some testimony there. I also just wanted to note for the record that uh, uh, the people, the 86 percent who signed the petition, I believe they did sign it for the 24-hour uh, petition, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, while uh, I, I'm certainly going to be supporting 1A as well, um, I do hope that, you know, and I appreciate the, the chamber and the accurate representative being here, and I do hope that we can come up with <clears throat> a good solution for the whole district that can also encompass Windsor Road. But, you know, the people of Windsor Road, you know, they have certainly made themselves heard. They've done everything that's required here, so I see no reason why we should not be granting them their petition. So, Mr. Chairman, just wanted to add to you that uh, uh, should the Commission approve the 1A, uh, the Municipal Code uh, allows that if secondary parking impacts occur because of the recommended parking restriction, the parking uh, pro, uh, professional parking can be expanded by the traffic transportation administrator as prescribed by the Municipal Code 10-36.030. Uh, one thing I would like to add, given the fact that uh, if this is to occur, the Maryland and Louise potentially could come into the city, they can ask for a petition, it doesn't come to the commission. Uh, including Maryland that's already been approved for? Uh, yes. Maryland already is there unless they come in. That would be a change in the original professional parking. If, let's say they wanted to go seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But the other two can be expanded administratively should they uh, submit a professional parking petition that would meet the required percentage without coming to the commission. Sh uh, should you desire... Uh, we will bring that to, to the Commission if that occurs. I think we'd like to see that, and, and if you were to approve it on any basis, I, I, all things being equal, I think it should be the same sort of 1A type solution because that's – because the, the reasons we're finding on Windsor, I think, apply on, on – <coughs> That's true. And, and possibly on the lease. But it does pose an interesting conundrum if, if the people who already went through the process on Maryland – they have to actually reapply again brand new? They can't follow I, under the, uh, the exemption? If we have changed it, um, this is something that is technically not covered uh, in the municipal code. Um, Mr. Garcia, if, I don't know if you can address that. Yeah, I don't uh, we have to look into head. it. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, we can look into it and yeah. inform okay. you uh, what would that happen if they, they chose to do so. 
Okay, so um, let's go ahead and vote on this, and then we can have some, some additional discussion on the, the, the uh, other item, the item number two. So is that it? everybody okay with that? Uh, so item somebody? number two, Mr. Chair, you mean the expanded study? Yes. Right. Okay, so we're separating both. Yes, Mr. Chairman, if, if you could have two. two there are two, two separate motions. items. There are two separate <coughs> items then. Okay, okay so can Sounds somebody good. please move uh, uh, 5-1-A, 5-A-1-A? Uh, I'll move 5-A-1-A. Second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Fwad? Aye. Commissioner Sahakin? Yes. Commissioner Yakubian? Yes. Commissioner Wiseman? Yes. Chair Preston Welch? Yes. And Mr. Chair, if I may, I know this, this vote is going to complicate things to staff because undoubtedly it will impact uh, adjacent streets and everybody will be coming to change their parking restriction to 24 hours. But please understand, given the circumstances and how this thing evolved tonight, BMW gave us no other choice but to, but to vote for 1A. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, next item, 5A2. Mr. Chairman, if, um, again, uh, essentially, given what you've heard, uh, this is a, essentially a, a typical um, situation with respect to on and off street parking between Colorado to uh, Los Feliz. We have this problem, uh, I believe, at least on this item, everybody is in agreement that we have to look at maybe some interim long-term solutions. And as I stated earlier in my uh, presentation, uh, we have consulted with our uh, mobility plan uh, consultant. I would like to take that to City Council. Uh, we'd like to the City uh, Transportation Parking <coughs> Commission uh, recommend to the city that uh, we go ahead and do the comprehensive study. Uh, we will ask the commissioners, uh, a one or two members of the commission, to participate in some kind of a task force similar to what we did for the professional parking program update of the ordinance as part of the mobility plan that you participate. We will invite uh, definitely auto dealer representatives and uh, property owners, residents to participate in that as well. We hope that it's probably about a six-month analysis. We do some surveys of the on-street, off-street. We look at the employee parking demand and come up with a number of alternatives and see which ones will apply and then get a consensus among everybody, bring it to TPC, and then we'll take it to City Council, probably a study session after that with recommendations that uh, will be hopefully approved by the City Council. So are you talking about basically conflating the, the whole concept of district parking with the South Grand Boulevard, or are you still going to try and keep the two? Th We're going to keep the two separate because the district parking, we still will do that as part of the uh, mobility plan, one of the recommendations in the mobility plan. We'll go ahead and make those amendments. We'll bring that to the TPC. This is basically a different uh, situation. We'd like to keep this as a separate item. It might be just a district by itself south of Colorado down to... Like was done at the college. That's exactly. Well, why are you stopping at Las Feliz? Aren't there, are there car dealerships south of Las Feliz? Are those impacted streets? There's, um, there's one. There is one. Uh, we have the hospital. The boundaries, uh, we will be determined. But that's yeah, generally yeah. the area that I think the most impacted area. The central obviously has its own issues. I mean, by iteration, you could sort of get pretty soon into the whole city. So I understand. There's, you there's not a lot of residential on around there south of Los Feliz, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. But on either side, essentially, you have the same issue with it. So, yeah. but, but Again, we'll look at the whole... Size it as you think. Part of the study will determine <clears throat> exactly the geographic area, and we'll, we'll bring back that area to the commission as well. Okay, so uh, uh, I, d I didn't see that there was a particular motion in there. Yes, there is. Is there one? Yeah. I believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay, can somebody please I'll move, move that? I'll move motion 52A. There's no way. Let me do a motion. I will second it. Okay, roll call please. Hi, Commissioner Fwad? Aye. Commissioner Stahakin? Aye. Commissioner Yakubian? Yes. Commissioner Wiseman? Yes. Chair Preston Welch? Yes. Okay, uh, next item, Chair, please. Oh, yes. Can I ask a question to staff and maybe, maybe city attorney also? Now, as far as uh, 
making the decision of uh, in the planning process of how many spaces a dealership or or any other business should allocate for for their employees uh, who makes that decision is it is it council or is it the planning commission in other words uh, if 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 a dealership has 45 employees the city tells them then you need to allocate 45 spaces for those employees it is based on uh, square footage of the building that they will building and they uh, that will determine how many spaces are required depending depending on the type of use uh, however, my understanding... That's general number of parking. I'm not yeah. talking about that. I know. I'm but then it doesn't, okay. uh, it doesn't spell out, and Ms. Garcia can help me out, uh, that it should be X number for employee, X number for customer service, etc. When you look at that whole number that's in the code requires it, it takes into account that that number of spaces required for a combination of customer, employee, uh, visitor parking. Uh, however... I wanted to ask the Mr. I mean, Tatusian if I think in one of our one or two of the recent approvals for auto dealership that there was a specific number that was required that they have to designate that number of spaces for that particular dealership. Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Uh to sort of go back to the initial question, with any development project, they have to submit an EIF form, an environmental information form, which outlines several questions in terms of parking, employee parking, potential customer parking. These are all projections for any kind of a development project. The parking is based on the, on the zoning code. Then as part of the analysis, the traffic department looks at the potential demand based on ITE numbers and looks at the numbers that are being provided and then does a comparison to see potentially if, if there's a parking, potential parking impact or a traffic impact. And mitigation measures are based on those analysis. In terms of the current um, auto dealers that we're working closely with, we are trying to pin down the number of employee parking spaces on site along with uh, visitor parking as well. Typically, many of the uh, auto dealers are providing additional parking for inventory purposes, which are clearly separate from the code required parking. I'm hoping that's answering your question. Well, but here's the loophole. I understand <clears throat> there's no regulation that tells a dealership that you cannot have more than 30 employees. Or any business. Or, or, any, or business. any business. Now, Current code well, is based on any business, use. But, but dealership, uh, the incentive is commission. So the more salespeople you have, possibility you sell more vehicles. So there's nothing telling a dealership that you cannot have 200 employees. Okay? Now, that's true. Now, these employees have to park somewhere. Okay? What I'm asking is, if staff can look into this, and find out because it's a big loophole and and honestly the expansion of, of, of uh, Mercedes terrifies me it does we're gonna be in the same boat again dealing with this issue what has happened in the past it has happened in the past and we need to find a fine balance between the residents and the businesses but it's a problem this Commission sees it as a problem and in the future if there are new developments we need to address it well uh, um, Commissioner Sahak and maybe this is a good opportunity for me to at least share with you our perspective. Okay. We are charged to work with auto dealers very closely along with other businesses along South Brown Boulevard. We constantly balance that with the interests of our resident community down there. So we're not taking necessarily one over the other lightly. This is a, that's why we've been working very closely with John and his staff and pl uh, planning staff to look at a comprehensive plan uh, because it's not just auto dealers. It's the, the churches, the hospital, um, the successful restaurants that we have South Brand Boulevard that are, you know, um, we're happy that they're here, but they also bring their associated um, issues. So I would hate to pinpoint one business category, but it's an, it's an overall issue that we're trying to address at the same time try to balance the quality of life for our South Glendale uh, residents. Well, I, and I have, a, I have a sort of a follow-up question on that. Do you... Do you feel that you can, for new construction where there's actually new capacity being created, do you think you have the power to, in effect, require uh, a dealership or a restaurant or anybody to, to have, to require employees to park 
in the, in the newly constructed. I'm going to look at our, uh, my city attorney to help me out because I don't believe we have any provisions. We've done it by negative thing yeah. with this parking district, but I wonder, can we affirm or we just say all employee parking has to be on site? Uh, Commissioner Five, we've never done that by code or uh, as far as I know, we're, we've never done an environmental document where we've actually had an operational condition requiring the employees to park there. And it, it may be because it, from an enforcement perspective, it's difficult to, to handle, uh, but even in the case that this case, the condition was a construction condition, meaning they had to provide the code required parking, um, and they had to do that prior to getting their certificate of occupancy, as, as you all have, as, have noted. Um, so I don't think we've ever done it. It's something we could look at if. if um, so you're not sure whether the current codes would, would allow it or not allow it. Right. We're not. Well, I know that the code doesn't currently require us require to require it, but, right. but could you if you were so? We'd minded. have to look at that. Yeah, maybe you could. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so let's move on to uh, item number six. Item six, commission staff comments, updates. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, in your packet, uh, I uh, listed a number of upcoming agenda items. I have not assigned a date to those uh, items because a number of them, it's all dependent on other divisions or departments in the city that we're working on uh, in order to complete a project. For example, the bikeway master plan, uh, we were working on that. Uh, we will be bringing that to the commission. There's a number of activities going <coughs> on with that. The downtown wayfinding parking signage program, we're working with the redevelopment agency staff and developing that program. We'll be bringing that to the commission. Uh, as I get more specific timelines on each one of these items, I will be bringing those items to the commission. But for sure, for the next month's meeting, we have the we have non-emergency medical vehicle applications that uh, currently the staff reports are being prepared, and those will be scheduled for the commission's consideration in March. Uh, one more item in terms of the taxi ordinance. I wanted to update the commission that the commission's action on last uh, month with respect to GNS uh, uh, company that operates CityCap uh, has been appealed by the applicant. Uh, the commission decision has been appealed to the city council. And we will be taking that to the city council, uh, requesting uh, the council to approve the appeal. In other words, if they approve it, they have to set a hearing date. They, can, they, they agree with the appeal process. They would have to set a hearing date uh, for them, for the city council to hear it. Or if they dismiss it, essentially, then a uh, commission decision will stand. Um, along with that, we will uh, list the Commission's concerns, the reasons the Commission uh, said that why they wanted to not allow them to have the five-year extension. And uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yourself or any member of the Commission can uh, attend the City Council meeting just to represent the, uh, the City Commission on the reasons that the Commission felt that type of a, uh, action should take place. We will inform you. Uh, as to that, and where staff will be preparing a staff report before it goes to uh, City Council, I will circulate that staff report at the same are, time. Are you making a recommendation that they accept the appeal? No, we, we don't uh, make recommendations. We okay. will make the, we will present the Commission's decision as to this is what the Commission's decision is. Okay. At that point, we're not making a recommendation, basically saying this is what the Commission recommended. This is what, based on public testimony in a public hearing, <coughs> the applicant has a right to appeal, and they have appealed it. City Council, these are your options, including what the Commission determined to do is to essentially uh, have a sunset date with all these applications or the permits to expire all at the same time so that we can go through maybe an RFP process of some sort and uh, allow all different taxi cab operators to uh, basically submit a proposal and the Commission will consider it and, and as a result of that we also have to amend the taxi cab ordinance in the city. So that would be the process we would follow. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no other update. We gave them four years, didn't we? It was close to four years. Uh, that's correct. Right. They, they're seeking, uh, <clears throat> it's on a very brief uh, statement, and I, again, I will forward that to the commissioners. Uh, it's just that they want the five years yeah. that was approved in previous years. Um, there's one other item I want to uh, include on here, and it was something uh, 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 Commissioner Sahakian had brought up about having the, the, the TPC having some involvement in 
uh, the planning process when variances are being requested. And I say this because last month I had the opportunity to sit through the hearing for the Salem Street project, which was requiring requesting a significant variance in parking. And, you know, that was one of those that, that uh, as I was sitting there listening, I said, this is something that we should have had the opportunity to comment upon because it was a big reduction in parking that was being requested. It was on a street that, yes, conceivably has some access and, you know, because it's a few blocks away from transit, but it's not directly served by transit. And I think in that particular case, I guarantee you at some point in time, we'll have the residents of Salem Street coming in here wanting preferential parking on their street. So case in point, just like tonight. So. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm sorry, I left that off our list. I will discuss this with the redevelopment uh, agency, uh, redevelopment staff and the planning director to bring back to you, I mean, have them come to the commission and kind of have a discussion about that okay. as to the process and what other things can be done in order to address those types of issues. Thank you. Anything else? Any? I, I, in our December meeting, we talked about uh, uh, impacted parking on, on apartments, I think, around Maryland Avenue, further north on Brand, such as landlords not devoting parking spots to parking, using it for storage or selling it separately, or all, all that sort of, that, that hornet's nest. Is that is that included in this? Is that coming before our committee? That would be part of that uh, professional parking ordinance amendment that we're working on that would deal with uh, a uh, certain requirement that we can put into the ordinance that would require uh, property owners, you know, making the, their garages available for their tenants and not use it for storage or even residential units for that matter. They have the same, they do the same, where they close their garage and they store, you know, things in the garage and then they are relying on on-street parking. That would be part of our uh, ordinance amendment. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, the only thing I wanted to add very briefly, and you already mentioned it, was the bikeway master plan. And it's kind of an issue because the city of Glendale has uh, missed an opportunity for lots of grant funding through not having that updated. So I just wanted to briefly say at least my preference would be to bring that before us, you know, as soon as possible uh, so the city doesn't miss out on any other opportunities for grant funding. Um, we are working on that, yes. Thanks. Anything else? There, just one one comment. Uh, during the storms, I, I noticed several intersections, they were on flashing red operation, probably due to the weather. Uh, now, they weren't fixed. For example, when, uh, two freeway off-ramp at, uh, at Mountain. Uh, it was 10 p.m., and then next morning at, at 8 a.m., they were still on flashing red operation, which created a tremendous traffic mess on the freeway, on the main line, and also to the college. Now, I understand it could be, you know, difficult to fix them that quickly, but on a, on a situation like that, I think LAPD traffic at least should go out there, a motor unit or two maybe, to basically control the intersection. As you could see frustration building up, and it was ready to explode. Uh, Commissioner Sagan, as you know, those, are, uh, those you know, two signals are Caltrans controlled. We did notify Caltrans, and because we don't have the authority to, to open their cabinets, okay. so, and we did our police department, we did, uh, again, they were stretched too, too much during the storm times, so we couldn't do anything, but then, uh, but we did, actually, we have a record that we did notify Caltrans, and okay. They were also stretched over okay, many, many so. other locations, unfortunately. As a result, uh, there was a delay. Understood. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else, we'll move to uh, item number seven. Item seven, adjournment. Adjourn. Second. Let's adjourn. <laughs>